Good evening, everyone, and welcome to GCT's Connecting with Nature webinar this evening. My name is Jen Jones, and I'm the head of programs for the Galapagos Conservation Trust. I'm here this evening with some really special guests, virtually, of course, uh, David de Rothschild, and some truly inspirational collaborators we have in the Galapagos Islands who lead our environmental education and connecting with nature work. It might be easy to forget sometimes that we are inherently connected with nature. We are nature and nature is us. Maybe we have been reminded a little more about that recently with the lockdowns due to COVID. From a conservation perspective, we know from research that stronger connections with nature for young people give them the voice to um, stand up for nature in the future. So if we want conservation stewards in the future, we need to be connecting young people and their families to nature now. Now this evening, we're talking about a place with some of the most spectacular nature on the planet, the Galapagos Islands of Ecuador. But what a lot of the fabulous documentaries we're used to seeing about this place don't always show are the people who live on the islands who are an important and integral part of the Galapagos ecosystem too, and therefore are an important and integral part of our work on the islands. Our Connecting with Nature program is designed with an engagement journey in mind. So taking people from being aware of an issue, translating that into proactive um, solutions and innovations that can help us to tackle the issues. We'll see some of those examples in the projects presented this evening. Although the majority of our work is with young people and their families, um, this journey can start at any age for any demographic of society and we're really keen on, on widening that reach through the Connecting with Nature programme too. And this work is more critical than ever before with the recent closure of the tourism industry that's had huge, huge effects on the Galapagos community with severe job losses, schools have been closed for over a year and there's been major economic strain on local families. GCT are committed to supporting the community's um, recovery, designing projects that will not only support conservation to get back on track, but also to support um, more sustainable livelihoods for the community in the future. And none of this work at all could be possible without your support. So we just want to thank you so much for being here this evening. And thank you so much to our inspirational partners on the islands for working with us to achieve the impact that we're all aiming for. Together, we really, really can make a difference here. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Hopefully you can see some chat options um, on your screen. If not, there's a little arrow to the right hand side of the window, which should um, allow you to see the chat box where you can put comments. Please introduce yourself. We like a friendly, um, interactive feel to these events. Um, we also have a specific question box for questions. So please put your questions in there. They will get fed directly to David, who's going to chair our Q&A session later. So um, now I am going to hand over to David. David is an explorer, an environmentalist, and the founder of the Voice for Nature Foundation. He is focused on reigniting the collective hope in the future of the planet um, and giving nature a voice, which really fits with um, our approach to the strategy of connecting with nature in Galapagos too. Over the last two decades, he's been harnessing this and traversing some of the world's toughest environments, most notably across the Pacific Ocean on his unique vessel, the Plastiki, that I implore you to Google if you've not heard of before. Um, and David's latest project, Rewild Yourself, aims to increase nature connectedness and create more equitable access to nature. Again, exactly what we're aiming to achieve in the Galapagos Islands through these projects. So without further ado, over to you, David. Thanks so much for being here. Brilliant. Thank you, Jen. Um, really excited to be here um, with all of you tonight for this very exciting um, discussion webinar, um, how our world has changed um, to think that here we are um, now sitting around the world chatting, having these incredible conversations. And obviously nothing is more important than um, the Galapagos as a center of hope for what is possible on this planet, but also um, connecting with nature. I think it's something that we can all um, sort of attest to that during the last year, um, you know, more um, being locked inside or being told you can't go outside and access those places. I know for myself, 
that was one of the things that really hit me the most was that sort of detachment from the place that I feel most comfortable. I guess my background, um, you know, sounds quite lofty and adventure and explorer and all these things. Um, I was just stubborn as a child and very curious. Um, I was the kind of kid who was always getting kicked out of the classroom being told, um, don't touch this, don't do that, get out there. And what you start to realize as you get a bit older um, is that we are all born explorers. Um, and the moment we're told not to touch something or don't, you know, ask that question or don't be silly and our ego gets in the way, um, that innate curiosity that we're born with, that inner explorer, unfortunately gets taught out of us. And as it gets taught out of us, um, we can sometimes um, just fall into the flow of the status quo um, and not ask the questions that we need to be asking. Um, to not only, um, you know, sort of evolve as an individual um, and then evolve as a species, um, but also to be able to live side by side um, with nature, which is why I'm always in awe of scientists. And we've got some incredible minds here tonight who are consistently and uh, uh, very um, admirably asking the questions that we need to be asking and finding uh, new questions and answers the whole time. So for me, my entry into the environment came from um, being kicked out of classroom, being far more comfortable outside the window, but really came through the lens of health. So I was um, really sort of, uh, I guess, fascinated by the fact that we often talk about these things in silos and we say, well, you're, you know, what do you, what is your, your, your bucket you want to be in? And so we say, well, I'm, I'm into health. And okay, well, you stay in that bucket. So I'm in environment, well, you stay in that bucket. Uh, well, I'm into education, well, you stay into that bucket. Um, and I think for me, as I started, I trained as a, a naturopath, I have a degree in natural medicine. I started to realize, you know, you are what you eat, you are what you breathe, and we're intrinsically linked. And then if you start to look closer, as Jen was saying, we are nature and nature is us. And so if you start to look at the systems around the planet and you can start to look at them side by side with the systems in the body. So you start to take our circulatory system and you can compare it to our oceans moving nutrients around our body or moving nutrients around the planet, regulating heat, um, you know, and as we start to kill our oceans, we start to see stagnation in our oceans. We can start to see cardiovascular disease on the rise. We can start to see hypertension, all these things on the rise. As we look at the soil of our planet and we denature it, we, you know, massive agribusiness comes along, uses tons of chemicals and strips the soil of all its nutrients and then dumps all these artificial nutrients. Um, you know, we see our soils dying around the world, run off into our oceans. The same thing if you look at our guts, we see the soil of our lower intestine and all the microorganisms and all the gut health problems that we start to see now as we don't treat our guts, um, you know, with the respect that they're due, similar to our soil. So you see these things, you see our lungs being connected to, uh, you know, the forests of the world that give us breath um, as we start to remove those forests and the pollution increases, we start to see, guess what? Card, you know, we move into um, disease of the lung, we start to see asthmas and we start to see people with um, more um, um, you know, problems with breathing. Um, and pollution, for example, is one of the biggest, um, sorry, I've got to turn that off, someone's calling me halfway through my speech that we have to come of, of being on live, live things. Um, so that was my brother um, telling me probably to shut up and move on. So I'm getting close to my um, five minutes. But the thing that really struck me and um, I think is really important to this conversation I'd like to see it is just for me, access to nature, connecting with nature has been a privilege. And it's a privilege for a number of reasons. Um, it's a privilege because I'm white and I'm a man and I come from a fortunate background. And, you know, for so many years, I've sat on stage or sat in conversations and said to people, go get into nature. and how, um, I guess, um, out of touch that is and how sort of privileged that is. And so for me, rewilding yourself and making access to nature more equitable um, in the last year has become a big part of our programming. And what we're trying to do is sort of say, well, you know, how do we get more people into nature? How do we provide skills? How do we provide access? How do we provide tools? Um, and how do we do it in a way that's equitable and fair? Um, and, and not just something that we can go and relax in or somewhere where we can call a hobby, but actually somewhere which is vital to our inner nature, as I was talking about. So I think tonight's discussion is going to be incredible. Um, I'm all very, very excited to see lots of you um, joining the little counter up there, probably from all around the world. Um, but obviously, um, nothing would be um, these conversations will be anything about all of us contributing. So there is, as you can see, chats, there is questions, there are polls. Um, and so I am going to start off, though, 
Um, those things we can start to get into in a bit. Um, there's lots of polls there, questions that people want to ask. Um, I'm going to now turn over and introduce um, uh, the first video. Uh, and the first, um, this is the Urban Family Gardening Project. Um, and this is, despite facing dozens of outdoor education group cancellations for 2020, the, uh, the Hacienda Tranquil team uh, Tranquila team has optimized resources and know-how to find a silver lining in the COVID-19 pandemic. So with the support from the GCT through their Connecting with Nature programs, project coordinator Ashley, who I know is here, and a team of local elementary school teachers co-designed an education project that motivates families to produce organic food together as well as to connect to their island identity by adopting endangered and endemic plants for their gardens. This project is aptly named the Urban Family Garden for Tranquility Project. Sounds amazing. I think we could all do with some of that um, on a daily basis. Um, so I am um, super excited by that. And I think we're going to run a little video um, uh, before Ashley's talk, if I'm not mistaken. Como Hacienda Tranquila venimos trabajando con la reforestación de plantas endémicas desde hace más de 10 años. Hemos visto con los voluntarios que nos visitan que su actividad favorita siempre es cuidar el huerto. Este año con el inicio de la pandemia hablamos con un grupo de docentes y analizamos cómo podemos apoyar que las familias realicen huertos en casa, pero no solamente como una actividad aislada, sino parte del currículo educativo. Entonces formamos un proyecto escolar, recibimos aval del Ministerio de Educación y trabajamos con más de 150 familias todo este año con unos resultados que realmente nos sorprendieron. Nunca le he sido buena para las plantas, pero con el inicio del proyecto de huerto en la escuela, pues me gustó y ahora pues tengo desde pimiento, tuve cosechas de pepino, en el cual cogí como 30 pepinos en la escuela, <ríe> me fue muy bueno. Y he aprendido por medio de las páginas del YouTube y de lo que nos indican ustedes, eh, el día de siembra, de poda. Para que eh, también es como una terapia, algo, algo que me distrae, distrae a mi nieta, distrae a mi mamá, que es una persona acá de 70 años también. Eh, eh, y eso nos ha hecho tener esto. Bueno, yo todos los días bajo con mi abuelita a revisar las plantas, veo los tomates, veo todo, veo, veo todito. Le sacamos las hojas que están marchitaditas, le sacamos los frutos, todo. Al principio no sabía qué hacer y era como que le tengo que cortar, le tengo que dejar que se caiga sola. Entonces era como que bastante interesante esa dinámica de, de ir como que viendo algo crecer y saber de que tú tienes que estar pendiente de los detalles para poder como que cuidarla de la mejor forma posible. Ya, ya ha florecido, ya tiene frutitas. Soy funcionaria pública, entonces durante la pandemia tuvimos un exceso de trabajo, estrés laboral, por todo lo que estaba pasando, ¿no? la realidad de Galápagos se complejizó bastante, pero al momento de tener mi huerto y el tiempo que le dedicaba a mi huerto era el momento en el que yo podía sentir ese tiempo para mí, en el que lograba olvidar todo eso, o sea, todo el caos. Súper bueno porque ahora más que todo que hay la pandemia, fue una ayuda sumamente importante para todos en casa. Lo que pasa es que como pasaba encerrado y el momento de ir al huerto era estar al aire libre, eh, eh, comunicarse con las plantitas, este, olvidarse de la tensión, de lo que decía la, la televisión. Nosotros sembramos, la mamá prepara y el resto de la familia lo degusta. Con nabo que cogí e hice sopas. Eh, a mis hijos le encantaron, le decían mami otra vez, pero bueno. <ríe> eh, me ahorro más que todo en lo que es el pimiento, el tomate, por ella, por tener una dieta, dieta balanceada que ella lo come por su diabetes, porque es diabética y hipertensa, entonces eso a ella le, le hace muy bien. Incluso hasta en mi trabajo me ayudó esto de los huertos porque es un tema más de conversación con los compañeros, de que cómo está tu huerto, que mira que tengo tal plantita, que te puedo regalar una, que te puedo regalar otra, y, y así va creciendo el huerto. Yo aconsejo que la mayoría de las personas pues es bueno tener nuestro propio huerto, así sea en baldes, pero tener algo que nos alimente nutritivamente, no con químico, algo natural, porque el sabor es muy distinto. Y el momento de tener dentro de tu huerto plantas endémicas te ha sido una experiencia que me ha permitido también entender más nuestras raíces como, como galapagueños. Gracias. 
Entonces, finalizando este año lectivo, hemos analizado los resultados y nos quedamos sorprendidos y emocionados por ver tantos resultados positivos en las familias. Observamos también que el 68% de los niños y niñas participando al inicio les gustaban las plantas o no les gustaba y ahora les encantan las plantas. Ya tienen una relación más cercana con la naturaleza. Y observamos que 89% de las familias aumentó su compromiso con el entorno, con la conservación a través de la adopción de plantas endémicas para su propio web. La educación ambiental es un eje transversal que en nuestro medio tan peculiar debe ser considerado permanentemente. Este tipo de actividad, como son los huertos familiares, a más de fortalecer la conservación ambiental, involucra a la familia a ser actores de la misma. Solo podemos amar aquello que conocemos. Gracias por esta oportunidad, por las donaciones de ese hermoso material didáctico, motivador, innovador, novedoso y educativo. Esperemos siempre contar con estos aportes tan valiosos para la comunidad y la educación. Invertir en educación es la mejor forma de ayudar a Galápagos, hacer entender a nosotros que como galapagueños tenemos una gran responsabilidad y que estamos en la capacidad de asumir. Entonces vemos que esta es una manera de acercarnos más como comunidad, de trabajar en conjunto y realmente de ver que el tema de conservación es un tema nuestro, es un tema que podemos todos trabajar juntos y lograrlo para el beneficio de nuestras familias, para el futuro de nuestros hijos y obviamente para la conservación de un lugar tan especial como es Galápagos. Wow, thank you. What an incredible, incredible video, Ashley. Um, so Ashley is, um, Klingman is a dual citizen of the US um, and of Ecuador. Um, she lives with her local family on the San Cristobal Island, has worked on community education projects more than 15 years. She holds a dual master's degree in public affairs and Latin American area studies with a focus on education for sustainability from the Indiana University um, and a dual bachelor's degree in environmental science and Spanish from the University of Kansas. Um, she's been uh, working for USAID in Washington, DC, and the Galapagos Governing Council in San Cristobal gave her a holistic perspective in policymaking, program design, and project management. But Ashley feels most at home designing, implementing, and evaluating grassroots projects with local stakeholders. She currently leads the CGT support of urban family urban family gardening project for tranquility with a family organization which you've just seen um i'd like to introduce um ashley now okay. greetings from san cristobal galapagos my name is ashley and i hope yes. you enjoyed our summary video of the urban family gardening for tranquility project thank you to gct for inviting me to participate in this webinar and to all of you for your interest in learning about my work as a grassroots project facilitator. In this brief presentation, I will show you how my 15 years of experience in Galapagos have prepared me to co-design and soon scale up this exciting grassroots project. I'll also tell you why these types of projects are so essential for conservation. It's helpful to process with who I am. I'm a creative designer. My passion is to explore the most effective methods and frameworks for human development. I began more than 20 years ago when I realized that conserving animals and our environment depends on human agency. A university could find me simultaneously studying, working, and volunteering in multicultural community and environmental education activities. This dynamic allowed me to gain valuable practical experience and empathize with people from different backgrounds. I came to Galapos in 2005 on a Fulbright grant, and after fortuitously meeting and marrying the love of my life, I became a permanent Galapagos resident. Recognizing the privilege that I have to live on these amazing islands, I have de dedicated myself to service. Like many working moms lately, I currently balance my energies between virtual schooling of my two sons and continuing to shape grassroots projects through our family organization, Hacienda Tranquila. My mantra is Mahatma Gandhi's motivational phrase, be the change you wish to see in the world. So on this slide is a photo of my eldest son and me planting an endemic Darwin's lycocarpus in our garden. I'm going to show you a few images to give you a very brief overview of my varied work experience that has helped, helps me creatively connect needs with opportunities. 
After finishing my Fulbright research, I published a workbook and implemented the Youth Vision 2020 project in San Cristobal High Schools to share my research findings in a very practical way. Always in touch with local needs, I honed my strength through my master's studies and work experience in the U.S. backstopping international development projects from Washington, D.C. But desiring to return full-time to San Cristobal, I won a grant to co-design ecological campaigns with a group of teenagers in afternoons while I worked as a local high school teacher in the mornings. This experience helped me to develop empathy with the educational community while I facilitated new creative learning opportunities. Later, I was hired by the Galapagos Governing Council as an education policy specialist where I designed intersecting ecological and human development processes ranging from responsible plastics use policy to violence prevention networks. In my free time, I voluntarily led organizational development of the Gecko Galapagos Local Association, securing funding to improve and scale up my previous ecological campaigns in line with government policy, thanks to funds from organizations like GCT. Most recently, I worked at the Galapagos Science Center where I co-designed the current Connecting with Nature program funded by GCT before refocusing my energies on, my orga on organizational development for Hacienda Tranquila. So as you can see, I've become a creative designer through a process. Likewise, effective proce projects must follow scient scientific-based pro processes. So the method I used is environmental psychologist Doug McKenzie Moore's community-based social marketing. His method helps define the focused behaviors that the project intervention aims to modify. The framework that I use is Teton Science School's place-based education. This framework helps structure a project to optimize learning in an each human-shaped place. For this project, we analyzed how to motivate families stressed by the pandemic with the few resources that we had on hand. We then structured an intervention that would empower these families to enjoy learning together, cook healthier meals, create a peaceful place to marvel at nature and see our endemic plants through new eyes. We used the method and framework from the previous slide with the project impact evaluation. This step is so important to visualize individual and collective outcomes. Finally, this grassroots project, community project motivates each participant to have a multiplier effect on their community while we are optimizing resources and complementing similar projects. For example, we use an endemic plant informational guide that was co-authored by Anne Gusseau, a colleague who will share her project after me on this webinar. We also complement the ongoing Education for Sustainability teacher training program that has recently introduced place-based education. We therefore motivate and reinforce complementary efforts. Together, we are connecting local citizens with nature. Through sharing my brief story, I hope you will see how motivation kindles agency to conserve our special place. Generating fun materials together motivates teachers to share their creativity and to spark children's innate curiosity. Working as a community yields enduring results and more citizens feel empowered to help conservation with simple actions. In closing, the late American environmental leader, Rachel Carson, reminds us, if a child is to keep alive his inborn sense of wonder, he needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it with him, rediscovering with him the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. With our ongoing Urban Family Gardening for Tranquility project, we are motivating more adults to fulfill their essential roles to help reconnect our children with nature. We are so happy to do our part to celebrate and conserve Galapagos. Thank you for your interest and support to continuing planting the seed of motivation and nurturing its ongoing growth. Another amazing mission-driven conversation coming out from Ashley. Um, thank you, Ashley, um, for all the work you do. I know I'm definitely, um, I wish I had someone like you in my life when I was growing up. Um, I don't know if any of you on the chat know this um, or I'm watching this, but um, we will put up a little link right now um, in the chat for everyone to see, which is um, one of the uh, CGT's um, resources is called Discovering Galapagos. And um, this is something that um, can be used. It's in Spanish and also in English. Um, so it's resources, um, how children can connect to nature um, and adapted to home learning, um, obviously because of pandemic. Um, so there is a link there um, for you to check it out. Um, and if you're going to use it, please do spread the word using hashtag Discovering Galapagos. Um, so next up, I want to introduce another video um, about the Gills Club, which is super cool. Um, started by um, Diana um, Pamizno. Um, uh, she is the Gill Club, is aiming to get younger women um, out into shark science. Um, so CGT is supporting this project as part of a wider outreach um, to empower young people 
um, especially young women, um, to generate and deliver conservation and sustainability projects. Um, I love this. I think this is really close to my heart. Um, you know, I always use a stat, you know, saying that we're, we're more afraid of, um, you know, unfortunately getting in the ocean and being eaten by a shark then we are losing the species, um, which always upsets me a lot because anyone knows that we need sharks as the apex predator in the ocean to keep them healthy. Um, and we definitely need loads of young scientists. So I'm gonna run a little video now and then I'll introduce a bit more about Diana and her work. So um, let's take it away with another video. Hello, I am Diana Pazmiño. I'm a researcher at the Galapagos Science Center in San Cristobal Island in the Galapagos. I am born and raised in the islands. I come from Isabela, which is the biggest of the islands here. And my current work in the Galapagos Science Center is actually focused on conservations of sharks and rays. A few years ago, in 2019, um, myself together with other students and researchers um, decided to start um, a chapter of the Gills Club here in the Galapagos Islands. So the Gills Club is um, this club for girls. Uh, it's originally started with the White Shark Atlantic Conservancy. And the idea is to uh, put little girls in touch with female researchers and scientists so they know from first hand what is it like to be a scientist. And we teach them how um, the scientific method works. Uh, we teach them how to um, ask their own research questions and, and the methods they can use in order to respond to that particular question. So we start very, very um, small on what is a shark, um, how it's the ecology of a shark. We take them to the lab to see the tissues, the different tissues of a shark. We take them to the field with us to see the monitoring of um, nurseries of sharks and rays and teach them why this is important. So uh, this is in ages eight to 12. Uh, we have 12 girls in the club now. They're very excited to go out to learn to do something different. Um, why I think this is important? Well, for many things. First, when we talk about sharks, many times people think, ah, oh, that's a dangerous job. Um, but that's actually not true. And there are tons of examples of female researchers in the sharks world. And um, when you grow up listening to all these things, you cannot do that. This is not for girls. This is not for you you eventually start believing that. So we are giving the girls a chance to see and to decide uh, what they want to do and, and to see what is it really um, to be a researcher and a scientist. So they know that uh, there's that option for them as well. Hola, mi nombre es Camila Ojeda Polo. Tengo 11 años y soy parte de Kids Club. En este increíble grupo he aprendido muchas cosas sobre terrestre. También he conocido muchos animales que son parte de estos espacios de vida. Me gusta mucho formar parte de este grupo porque nos enseñan de una forma divertida y agradable. Y lo que a mí más me gusta, lo que a mí más me agrada es la vida marina. Y por eso quiero ser grande, ser una gran científica. Que es uno de mis sueños que quisiera realizarlos para poder salvar muchas especies que están en peligro de extinción y las que no, para que no lleguen a este tipo de situación. Gracias, Gips Club. Awesome. We definitely need uh, more of that. Um, interesting, on all of my expeditions, I've always had female leaders across the North Pole uh, with a 19-year-old girl and Plastiki Joe Royal, who was instrumental in getting us across the Pacific safely. Um, if you leave it up to us men, we tend to do horrible things um, continually. So I'm really excited by what Diana is doing. Um, and um, as you've just seen, she's doing incredible work. Um, she's a professor at the University of San Francisco de Quito. Um, she was uh, born in the Galapagos Islands, so she knows it, loves it there. She's, you know, um, is better informed than anyone, I guess. Um, she's got a PhD in marine science from James Cook in Australia um, and is now a geneticist studying the connectivity of shark and ray populations in the Galapagos um, and the wider Eastern Tropical Pacific. Um, she is a passionate environmental educator 
um, especially around strengthening the capacity of young lo local scientists, especially women, to conserve the Galapagos Islands into the future and help set up the Gills Club in Galapagos. Um, she is one of the leaders of the Citizen Science Barcode Galapagos Project. Um, and so we are now going to hear from her. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the community engagement work we do here in the Galapagos. I told you already I come from the Galapagos Islands, and this is a picture from Isabella from um, Tintoreras Isle, which is a tiny isle, a tiny isle just in front of Isabella Town. And this is where I think everything started for me. If you see this bunch of sharks in this channel, that's no more than two meters wide. And uh, when I was a kid, we used to come here and swim and snorkel with friends and family with these sharks. And of course, I was extremely scared. Sharks were bigger than me, but I was also very curious about these animals and started asking tons of questions and started learning a lot together with my um, family. Not only about uh, the sharks itself, what they do, um, some things or what they eat or how they swim, but also about all the threats and challenges they had. And I was very, very surprised to know they are extremely vulnerable animals and that some species are highly in danger. So this shaped a lot of my life, I think, and um, uh, how I became a marine biologist that um, works in frog conservation. So after um, growing up in the Galapagos, I moved to Quito where I did my undergrad. I um, work with frogs at this point, but um, I had my first encounter with genetics. I am now a conservation geneticist because I think I learned how much information genetic tools can provide and how many questions we can answer with this information that can support conservation of life. Um, after that, I went to uh, Townsville in Australia to the other side of the world, a scary journey, but a very, very beautiful journey as well, where I started focusing a bit more on the marine um, area and working with sharks. And a few years back, I came um, to the Galapagos again, and I am now doing a little bit of everything. But not only I am doing some research projects, but I'm working in community engagement as well. And this is probably one of the parts that I like the most about the job. I have here. I have the chance to work with kids and with young people and with local women and with local fishermen to um, talk about conservation, to teach a bit what I know, but also to learn a lot from them. One I'm most proud of is this Gills Club. Uh, we translated that and get, uh, got our own logo that you can see here to Chicas con Agallas. And um, this is part of a wider global initiative, the Gills Club that was started by the White Shark Atlantic Conservancy. And a few years ago, we decided to open a local Galapagos chapter here. Uh, we started with 12 girls, um, and this was an initiative led by a couple of student and female researchers from the Galapagos Science Center. So the general idea globally is to connect and to put these little girls in touch with female role models, with scientists of different kinds of different um, branches of science. So they um, know all their options and they see that this is actually an option for them to follow a career in, um, in STEM. So we use this space uh, to, to work with the kids and to teach them about science in general. So the scientific method, we teach them how to use a microscope, how to um, use quadrats and transects to respond to different ecological questions. And um, we start from very small and encourage them to go and ask their own research questions and respond to their own research questions using the scientific method, which is great. And this photo was taken just before we went on our first field trip. Um, we were going snorkeling in um, a bay called Tijeretas here in San Cristobal. For some of these girls, this was the very first time uh, they were doing snorkeling. So this is just to, to, to point out on how, even though we live on an island that we're surrounded by the ocean, sometimes this connection with the ocean, it's not as strong as we may think. And uh, for me, when I was a little kid, having the chance to go there and to swim with sharks and to um, learn about these things about the nature was, uh, was life-changing. So we hope this is life-changing for them as well. 
Uh, this is a photo from later that same day. This is how the trip ended. Um, nobody wanted to go out of the water. Uh, they were just seeing so much life, little fish and sea urchins and sea stars, and they were extremely happy. But we do all other kind of activities as well. We take them to the um, to the beach. We teach them a bit of everything. We take them to the field with us when we do the monitorings as well. So this was a trip where we do um, baby ray monitoring. So we teach them why is it important to monitor these areas and what is that we are expecting to see change with all the information we're developing. And as I was telling you, we also take them to the lab. We also have some fun activities in the lab. Uh, this was the day that we were, um, where we were seeing the different tissues of a shark under the microscope. So how does the skin looks and how does the liver look versus how does you know, the teeth look? So it was, it was um, really, really great. And um, one of the things that I'm very proud of with these um, activities that we do is that, for example, um, Christmas last year, one of the, one of the moms come, uh, came to us and told us, you know, this is the very first time that my little Amy is asking for a microscope instead of a doll. So that was uh, absolutely um, beautiful for us. Um, and this um, takes me to another project, um, the Galapagos Genetic Barcode Project that we just started a few months ago and is the biggest citizen science project that has ever been done in the Galapagos. And it's also a project with community engagement because we are teaching local people local naturalist guides, local farmers, local fishermen, how to do science and how to, you know, from going to the lab and doing DNA extractions, doing PCRs, doing sequencing, but also going to the field and doing scientific collections properly, storing the samples properly and, and managing collections. So we have around 80 people that's been hired in this project um, that it's now learning and they're becoming scientists with us. And this is very important because often uh, when a conservation uh, project does not have the support from local people, it's more likely that it will not be able to sustain in the long term. So this is very, very important. Here's um, one of the days that we were training uh, these, these locals on how to do eDNA collection. So how when we're working with eDNA that I was telling you before, it's very important that you're very careful to avoid contamination. So they were learning, they've never seen this type of equipment, they're never done this, but they're so excited to learn. So these are just two of the projects. The Science Center in, in, in fact has a lot more projects with community engagement, which you will probably um, soon hear of. Um, but these, these are the, the two main I wanted to share with you today. So if you have any questions, if you uh, want to contact me at some point, please feel free to do that. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about this anytime. Thank you very much. Wow, super, super inspiring. And um, obviously we need your help um, to keep supporting projects like the Gills Club um, and the Urban Family Gardening Project. So please, 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 um, if you can, donate. Uh, if you can't, um, uh, you know, reach out, see if um, you can see it's popped up there. Please donate here. Um, and donation doesn't always have to be uh, monetary. It can be spreading the word, social media, um, letting people know about the great work that you're learning about, telling your community, telling friends, um, all of the work that you're going to see here tonight and all that's being discussed is driven by passion to create a healthier planet for all of us to get us connecting to nature to protect this hope spot as the great Sylvia Earl would say um, in the Galapagos everyone here is driven I think by the same mission so help spread the word help donate get online um, tell people through social media um, this is um, what we really need your help with. Um, I am now going to introduce the third talk. Um, and um, this is Anne um, Gezu, um, is an education outreach coordinator in the Galapagos. Um, and um, she's a dual citizen of France and Ecuador. And she is also a resident of Santa Cruz Island. 
Um, Anne is trained in general biology with projects in marine research at the University of West Florida, which led her to shrimp farming in mainland Ecuador. Her true passion, however, has always been environmental conservation. So she has decided to make the jump to Galapagos 30 years ago. Um, I wasn't born then, um, bad joke. Um, to work as a national park naturalist guide aboard cruise ships um, and then became a botanist at the Charles Darwin Research Station and took part in applied research on the introduction and invasive plants as well as threatened endemic species. She's further investigated plants, systematics and tropical botany by completing a master's study at the University of Montpellier in France. Um, over time, Anne has increasingly become involved in environmental education that she views as a keystone to conservation and sustainability. And since 2017, she's embracing it fully in her education outreach work with the CGT in Galapagos. Anne's talk will also include a video from Lady Marquez, the Galapagos Local Program Coordinator for Ecology Projects International, who CGT also works with. Um, so there is um, gonna be a video now, and I hope you Thanks a lot, David, for it. the introduction. Thank and you. Hello, everyone. People regularly ask me why I got so involved in education. Well, over time in France, in Ecuador, I have witnessed how today's youth, who are the decision makers of tomorrow, are increasingly losing their connection with nature. This unfortunately holds true in Galapagos as well. I strongly believe it has become a priority to reconnect its younger generations with their natural environment and empower them with the conservation and sustainability of the archipelago. So how do we do about it? What is our recipe? We can recall the words of Sir David Attenborough, no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced. This is the essence of our first ingredient, an experiential or hands-on approach. Live it, do it, try it for yourself and share it. The second ingredient of our education recipe is using science as a base. And what best than working with the project supported by Galapagos Conservation Trust? In my case, so far mainly two of them, the Galapagos Turtles Movement Ecology Program and the Plastic Pollution Free Galapagos Project. Last but not least, our third ingredient is collaboration that is working in partnership to create local synergies, whether with individuals, citizen groups, schools, public or private institutions, or NGOs. In 2017, I started applying our recipe with the Galapagos Turtles Movement Ecology Program. Its main objective is to improve understanding of Galapagos Turtles movements, including migrations, and the social, ecological, and sanitary aspects that may affect their conservation. We have designed a whole set of activities that can be carried out as standalone or built into longer-term projects, either as part of curricular or extracurricular education for any ages from kindergarten to 18 years old. Here you see a class of four years old on a turtle safari at the National Park Reserve where the children met the giant tortoises in their natural habitats. We tracked the tortoises with an antenna, watched them walk, eat, rest, breathe, and also discussed their internal anatomy with our tortoise puppet. This field activity was organized in collaboration with Galapagos National Park educators and park rangers. And as often, what I found most amazing is how it turned out to be a learning experience for all, including the kids, of course, but also teachers, parents, and us. We also carry out longer-term initiatives like the Student Participation 100-Hour Project, part of the high school curriculum for 16 and 17 years old. A variety of topics are then addressed through a whole set of activities. Here, a Paso de Tortuga, a questions hand run in teams at the Turtles Breeding Center in order to gain basic knowledge on turtles. During a telemetry field trip in the highlands of Santa Cruz, the youngsters learn why and how to use the devices to track tag tortoises and download movement data. And to get a better understanding of the importance of movement ecology, the students are challenged to analyze their own movements and compare them to the tortoises. In the field, we collect tortoise dung 
to later analyze their content, separate and identify seeds, a great way to get a grasp of the tortoises' role as seed dispersers in Galapagos ecosystems. Our health activities are among the favorites. Students learned about the anatomy of the tortoises with hands-on games and lab work under the guidance of Ainoa, researcher and veterinarian, who also emphasizes the importance of the One Health concept, even more so relevant since the COVID pandemic. Last but not least, how to communicate. On the top picture, two students are interacting during a workshop run in collaboration with the Charles Darwin Foundation communication team. The other images illustrate the work of two girls who designed, tested, and produced infographics on turtles restoration and antibiotic resistance that they later posted in town. In March 2020, confinement was declared in Ecuador. All in-person education activities came to a complete stop. As an alternative, and thanks to our collaboration with the Charles Darwin Foundation Eco Program, we have created and delivered sets of virtual interactive lessons for high school students via Zoom and WhatsApp. We are soon also to test with primary students our new Tertus's home learning pack created by Sarah, our wonder teacher in UK. Our Tertus education and outreach work is taking place mainly on Santa Cruz Island and to a lesser extent Isabella. And we also plan to soon reach out to San Cristobal. Mi nombre es Lady Márquez, trabajo para Ecology Project International, una fundación sin fines de lucro que busca empoderar a jóvenes de la comunidad para poder desarrollar proyectos de conservación y tomar un rol activo en la misma. Dentro de, la, de EPI tenemos el Club de Ecología Mola Mola, un grupo activista de jóvenes que se encargan de conservar y proteger la fauna y flora de su comunidad. Adicionalmente, también el Club de Ecología busca formar jóvenes dentro de las comunidades donde estamos trabajando. Ya llevamos varios años trabajando en un proyecto liderado por los mismos jóvenes de este Club de Ecología. El proyecto es el proyecto de educación y ciencia ciudadana para la protección de la tortuga verde en el sitio de anidación Tortuga Bay. Durante siete años consecutivos hemos empoderado a jóvenes de este club de ecología para que puedan eh, principalmente identificar nidos, protegerlos y es, al mismo tiempo es un mini ejercicio donde ellos pueden realizar un proyecto de investigación real, donde pueden colectar datos y esta información va a ser analizada posteriormente por ellos mismos y socializada a nuestros colaboradores principales eh, que vendría a ser el Parque Nacional Galápagos. Aprovechando esta oportunidad, una de las actividades o uno de los datos que también se colectan por los jóvenes es un proyecto, otro proyecto de ciencia ciudadana que es liderado por Galapagos Conservation Trust, con quienes levantamos, hemos a, apoyado para levantar información de línea base acerca de la presencia y dinámica del microplástico en esta playa principal, sobre todo qué tipo de, de microplástico está presente y también <coughs> poder tener una relación entre el, esta problemática de la presencia de plásticos en esta playa junto con el tema de anidación. As presented by Lady, our second main theme is plastic pollution, a growing concern in Galapagos as elsewhere. We decided to focus on microplastics, a topic hardly explored so far in the archipelago. Thanks to EPI's invitation to collaborate with their sea turtle initiative, we have been able to run our microplastic project in parallel for three years now. The various groups involved are the Mola Mola and Tibus Embajadores Ecology Clubs, respectively of EPI and Charles Darwin Foundation, and students of various local high schools as part of a curricular activity led by the Galapagos National Park and Marine Reserve. The objectives are to contribute to scientific research in microplastic while playing a proactive role in the local community. Our main study site is Tortuga Bay, a green turtle nesting beach located on the southern coast of Santa Cruz, accessible by foot from the town of Puerto Ayora. We co-designed a method with our GCT colleague Jen Jones, who has been investigating microplastic in Galapagos for her PhD studies. 
Microplastics are sampled in quadrats set up along transects. After a general introduction on microplastics, we are out in the field. Here at Tortuga Bay, two teams are sampling each a quadrat along the same transect, left in the nesting zone and right at the high tide line. Teams learn why and how to implement a scientific method, how to take field notes, use a GPS and a compass, and how to record tides, climatic parameters, and other determining factors. How are these used? Our first year data were integrated to Jen's research and will be part of a publication soon to come out. And building on this baseline, our latest results will be presented locally by the teens to the Galapagos National Park Directorate. Data are also available for any personal project to build upon. An opportunity grabbed by Danielle, who chose to investigate the presence of microplastics in depth, as the main theme for his final IB essay. And the first step in contributing to solutions is to share about one's experience and raise awareness, something our citizen scientists love to do on field sites with tourists and other young people, as well as at fairs and community events with general public. In view of the encouraging response to the Turtle and Microplastic Citizen Science Project, the initiative has grown this year to include new local partners grouped into a consortium on three islands, a new step toward finding solutions. I hope to have given you a good illustration of our environmental education recipe in Galapagos, experiential, science-based, and in partnership, and its encouraging results. Finally, I would like to invite you to watch and listen to Julian, member of the Mola Mola Ecology Club and active participant of our microplastic project. Mi nombre es Julián, tengo 18 años y formo parte del proyecto de microplásticos que va paralelo al proyecto de monitoreo de tortugas marinas. Este proyecto es importante porque podemos ver la presencia de micro y macroplásticos en las playas de anidación, como es la playa de Tortuga Bay. Estos datos, basado de una metodología que procedemos a realizar en las excavaciones, podemos ver la presencia de micro y macroplástico y luego compararla con años anteriores para ver si ha habido un impacto fuerte, si ha disminuido o ha incrementado con el paso de los años. Julián, uh, según tu criterio, ¿por qué es importante proteger la vida silvestre aquí en Galápagos? Es importante proteger la vida silvestre porque como todo el mundo ya conoce, Galápagos es un paraje único donde solo hay especies que no existen en otra parte del planeta. Por lo tanto, si desaparecieran causaría un gran impacto en nuestras islas donde ya no todo será igual. Así que si protegemos este medio ambiente en el que vivimos, se conservará varias especies únicas en el mundo. Um, well, thank you for that, um, Anne, and um, yeah, the tragedy of plastics that just keeps on um, turning up. Um, we, we set sail uh, 2010, uh, 10 years ago, the Plastic Key project started. Actually, the plastics project that uh, you just heard about was one of the main connections that I had um, with all the work that's being done by the Galapagos Conservation Trust. So it's really nice to see Anne's work and see the support that's continuing um, to try and um, solve this plastic um, problem that we continue to have, which keeps on growing, sadly. Um, even, I said this today, everyone said, but haven't we got this solved? And it's like, nope, uh, we're still using a ton more plastic than ever before. And on top of that, obviously the plastic keeps on breaking down into this micro pollution um, that is obviously absolutely tragic for the natural environment and for us as humans on this planet. Um, so next up is Lucia Norris, um, is a freelance consultant um, for um, the Galapagos Conservation Trust. Um, she is born in Ecuador. Her love and the environment began on a trip to Galapagos. Um, she worked for the WWF Ecuador in Galapagos and then came to the UK to do a MPhil in conservation leadership at Cambridge, funded through the Christchurch, Christchurch College Darwin um, and the Galapagos Fund, uh, which CTT helped to establish. Um, her story demonstrates how important it is to connect with nature from a very young age. So. Uh, there's another little video and um, hope you enjoy it. Hi, my name is Lucia Norris. Um, I want to tell you a little bit of my story. When I was four years old, I first came to the Galapagos Islands, to San Cristobal. My father, who was one of the first insurance brokers of 
local boat owners brought my siblings, my five siblings and I, to the Galapagos. And then one of the first things he did was to take us to, to the beach, to the Playa de los Marinos in San Cristobal. And he put us all in a line and he gave us snorkels. And one of the first things that I could do when I got here was to, to see a playful baby sea lion below water. That was one of the first experiences that struck me in so many ways. That and then the constant interaction with nature just made my life uh, turn completely to nature and to loving nature and to wanting to do something to protect it. While growing up, everything I did from school council to extracurricular activities, I was always focusing in doing things for nature conservation. When I uh, started university, I did a double major in international relations and communications. And I remember all the works I did for university were related to sustainable development, to climate change, to, to nature conservation. Um, when I started working, again, uh, I focused in, in uh, works to face climate change, to sustainable development. And then uh, when I uh, got married and, and had children, we came back to the Galapagos and I started working for WWF. Uh, it was a great experience in the Galapagos and at some point I felt I needed to, to, to get deeper into nature conservation. So I applied for this course that I thought was ideal, the MPhil in Conservation Leadership at the Department of Geography uh, at the University of Cambridge. And uh, after a hard process, I was accepted. And thanks to the Christ College uh, Darwin and Galapagos Fund, uh, which is actually uh, funded as well uh, by, by donors like GCT, I was able to do the course, the 11 months course that has helped me in many ways to, to advance my, my career in nature conservation focused in the Galapagos Islands. So when I finished that, eventually I could come back uh, with my husband and kids as well to, to, the, to the Galapagos. And now I am working for, for GCT as a consultant and, and doing uh, various jobs related to, to conservation here in the islands. Um, I really, really think that uh, connecting kids with nature is one of the most important things that we can do here. I was very lucky because I had a father that believed this was important and showed my siblings and I uh, the, the awesomeness of nature. But not every kid here has that opportunity. Uh, most kids in the islands don't know how to swim. They have never been to other islands. They have never seen below water. And, uh, and then uh, it seems a bit unfair that we ask uh, these kids to, um, to protect a place that they don't know. Uh, how can you love something that you don't know, right? So uh, I really believe that uh, doing uh, environmental education, but especially outreach education with, ching, uh, with kids, children, and, uh, and young people in the Galapagos is one of the most important activities that we can support and that needs to happen uh, here. Another amazing video. Um, I mean, if it isn't clear to you already, um, you know, these are incredibly important projects and you've seen um, these incredible humans who we're gonna now bring up on stage um, to discuss a little bit more, ask a few questions and get some Q&A. But please think about it this way, um, you know, in two buckets, we need awareness and we also of the projects that are going on. And more importantly, we need donations, um, donations of money, donations of time, donation of um, whatever it is you can give to help connect people to nature and bring all of these incredible projects back. So. Um, we're now going to have um, some questions, um, and Jen is sharing the stage with me. Hi, Jen. Hello there. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, so I'm going to ask the first question to Anne. Um, is Anne going to come up? There we go. Hey. Oh, this to is Ashley, Ashley. Rather. Sorry, Ashley. And then Hi. I think we've got Anne there as well. Or, or is, are, we, are we all going to come up on stage? Should we just get everyone up? Yeah, hopefully so. Yeah. Um, Brilliant. Well, firstly, thank you guys for putting all of this together. Um, I'm super, super excited by everything. And um, I, got, I even put a shirt on tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
to pretend to be serious. I'm not, I'm not normally this serious, if anyone else is wondering. Um, well, as Ashley, you're here, I'm going to start with you. Um, um, I have to ask the question, uh, you know, but is, is, you know, clearly, I'm assuming like the rest of the world, COVID is a problem in Galapagos. Um, uh, it, you know, what, what are the effects um, of, of obviously lockdowns? Are people getting vaccinations? I'm sure it's having a huge impact as it is everywhere. But can you give us a little bit of insight into what, what you're seeing on the ground and, and, and let us know how it's being, how it has, what the impact is having? Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, David, for the question. Thank you to Mark, too, who wrote the question in the, in the question box. So as I, as I mentioned there, um, we are there is a vaccine process right now, which is really positive. I think it's making all of us hopeful. Um, all they started, of course, with the most vulnerable um, people in the population. But now all adults are invited to participate, including even children or teenagers that are almost 18 years old. So we feel um, hopeful yeah, by the end of this month that the majority of people will be vaccinated, the majority of adults. Um, all the teachers have been vaccinated, which is really positive thinking from the education sector, which is more my area. Um, however, school, we just started school this week um, because our school system, our, our calendar starts from May and goes through February. But unfortunately, um, they, we, we can't do um, in, in class um, uh, presential or, or, or actual school like before. Uh, we're still doing it virtually. So the thing that's difficult is that um, there's a lot of socioeconomic um, uh, considerations we, we should think about. First of all, um, tourism is our main source of income. I think 70 to 80% of our economy is based on tourism. We've had a few tourists come, but not anywhere like the, the numbers we've had before. Uh, and so many families locally are um, really living on savings or some of them, there's actually a few people that are homeless. They, they can no longer pay rent. Uh, they really are looking at what options they can have. Uh, many people have gone back to the mainland. And so for the children, the concern is, is that there's also a lot of children that, because their parents don't have the money and connectivity in Galapagos is so con such a challenge, which is why I imagine my colleague Anne is not yet on the on the screen. It's always a little bit challenging here. So a lot of children are not able to participate in this virtual um, education. So that's why for our project, we see that it's so important to help them create a space at home, even if it's just a few pots somewhere that they can connect, the children can have some plant friends and connect with nature because also because of parents are desperately trying to find a source of income. Many of them uh, leave the children alone or if they're an only child all by themselves all day alone inside a tiny apartment and tell them not to leave. So they're with television, they're all by themselves. And so it's really still, still a challenge. Um, obviously we have a beautiful place in Galapagos, a beautiful natural environment, but because of a lot of, um, a lot of these social socioeconomic considerations, not all the children are able to enjoy that unless there's somebody that's motivating them to go out and motivating the parents to say, take some time, go plant, you know, go, go visit your plant. We need to measure the plant today. We need to water the plant. So that's where we really feel hopeful that we are, you know, making a small little con um, contribution. We're doing our part to try to help the people that are stressed in this pandemic to have a little, a few moments at least of um, tranquility in their day. Oh, you're a mute, David. I'm on mute. <laughs> I was just going to say thank you for that update. Um, and I'm sure it's just an incredible struggle. Um, obviously, losing that source of income, kids being, um, you know, not able to connect. Um, um, so it makes it even more important that we um, get behind your program and, and we can help um, the community down in the Galapagos. We're all very fortunate, um, you know, especially being where I am in London the moment um, to be able to connect, take things for granted like Wi-Fi and, and, and connection and things like that. So thank you for um, illuminating some of the problems that you're facing. And I, I hope with the vaccine rollout and, um, you know, that things will get back to a, a, a kind of normal, um, hopefully. Um, so, um, and thank you, Mark. Sorry, I saw that was from you in the in the chat. I'm, I'm just getting used some, to this this thing. Um, I know we've got another question coming in around the plastics, um, uh, but I'm going to wait a second and see if we can try and bring up. I think is if we, um, Anne's probably still um, trying to reconnect. Um, I mean, um, I might jump in on that. I'm, I'm sure Ashley, you'll probably want to jump in that. I mean, it, it's it's almost impossible. Jen, you can jump in on this. Um, and I'm sure others can attest, uh, you know, as good as you want to be, um, it's almost impossible to get off this plastic, um, you know, sort of train that we're on. You know, it's it feels to me that 
you know, no matter what we do, no matter how hard you try, no matter how good you think you can be, um, we are unfortunately got this toxic love affair with plastic that is turning up in our natural environment, turning up on beaches. And so the consequences for, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, for the island, for the Galapagos, I'm a, is just exponential, right? I mean, you must be seeing real issues, especially as well with, with the pandemic and the number of disposable plastics that are going to be washing up everywhere. So I'm sure, Ashley, you could probably talk to that as well a little bit. Or attest to that, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, any yeah. more questions? Yeah, I, right, I could go. add a little bit more on yeah. the plastics there as well. Um, I think it, it certainly is an issue and a growing issue. And now we have models that are good enough to project that if things don't change we'll have at least treble the amount of um plastic you know in the oceans sorry it's 30 times more um in 30 years or something very very fast uh, increase but what we do have is some great examples of innovation coming out there's a lot of technical um innovations to create more circular economies around plastics and i think although it is a huge issue it is a global challenge that we should be uniting together to try and find the solutions, which I know is where all of us are coming from. And I think in Galapagos, we really do have a unique opportunity to have a best practice, best case kind of gold standard of how a community can have a more healthy relationship with plastics. <clears throat> um, I really do feel optimistic that out of any other places in the world we have that opportunity in the islands and I know Ashley is a believer of that progress as well and what we hope is that if we can get things working in the islands we can um, scale those up in other areas because we do know that a lot of the plastics are arriving on ocean currents for sure they are coming from um, the fisheries they're coming from the continent they're coming from a wide range of inputs but if we can get these um, projects working in Galapagos and transfer them back to the mainland, over time we should be starting to reduce that input as well we're hoping to achieve. And I think the kids on the islands that are involved in our schools projects and citizen science are so motivated to do something about this issue that it does give you hope for the future. Yeah, and I see Anne, you've just jumped back in. We can't see you, but I, I think we can hear you. We were just talking, um, as you probably gathered, about the plastics issue. Um, and obviously the work that you're doing central to understanding the footprint. And just so um, I don't know if you want to jump in and add anything to the situation in the Galapagos right now around plastics. Well, I'm, I'm sorry because with the, I'm here with the lady, but we did not get to here. We had to, uh, everything uh, was shut off and we had to oh. restart everything. So we have not been able to follow the, the conversation. <laughs> So we the the, the gist I don't of the conversation something in particular. No, I think I think there was a, there was a question asked um, around single use plastics um, being you know and sort of you know what was the issues um, that you're seeing? Is there an increased footprint? Um, I mean, I know from from my work in in, in plastics with Plastiki over the last sixteen years, um, you know, this isn't a problem that goes away. Um, you know, clearly. From your videos and from the work that you're doing and and the support that you're building in the community um you know that there's a lot that can be done i mean are there things that you're seeing that are giving you signs for hope um because sometimes i feel overwhelmed as i'm sure a lot of people do when you're constantly reading about you know or seeing another image of another marine mammal um filled full of plastic breaks your heart um i don't know if there are um, things that you're finding and have changed in the last year with lockdown of the things that you're seeing that keep you positive when it comes to plastic, um, tackling the plastic problem? Well, what I see as very positive is that actually here uh, on Santa Cruz Island, there are many groups uh, who have started doing something about it. And that is not just uh, NGOs or research institutions, but really uh, citizen groups. Uh, and for example, that's why we, we're working with microplastic because already people are doing so much about the macro. And there is a lot of uh, also of um, awareness raising and actions that are being done. And I think uh, what I emphasize in my video, but also it's true that people are working more and more together. Uh, and for, for me, this is giving me um, a lot of hope. 
Well, it's always it's always good to have hope. Um, I guess you, it's 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 the it's the only way, really, right? Is that we have to keep on uh, keep on being positive. And there's nothing more positive than the next generation working with that enthusiasm and that energy. I know for my work, it's um, it's always uh, if you're ever feeling uh, a little low in energy or optimism, you just have to walk into a classroom um, and see their faces, and and that can do anything is possible attitude, which. You know, I, I think uh, we can all do with a little bit of. So again, everyone who's listening to this feed, um, no matter where you are, I see there's been tons of people saying hello from all over the world. Um, you know, everyone on this call, especially the videos you've seen, the scientists, uh, the activists, the educators, uh, are all working on your behalf to build a healthier future for the Galapagos and for the world. So right now more than ever we need your support to spread the message and obviously make donations there's been links put up in the chat um, there's tons of information on all these projects you can find them on the gct website um, and i know that a lot of work goes into these programs and um, i really just want to thank obviously everybody um, for for continually a listening in but um, for, for supporting in any way possible um, and so, I mean, I guess from, from my side, I know that we're running a little short on time. I know that everybody has been super, um, you know, um, generous with their time. Um, I feel very inspired. Um, I think we can all try and find moments in our lives to um, connect more with nature, which is ultimately connecting more with yourself. Um, we're living in a world where we're often told what's wrong. Um, and actually, there is so much about it that is right. So I think if we can all focus more on what connects us, uh, but versus divides us, what's possible versus impossible. If we can connect more to nature, which means we connect more to ourselves and our fellow species and the other species, just because um, we, you know we don't understand tortoise or whale or tree or or, or, or or any of these languages, doesn't mean that they're not saying something. So we continually have to listen, observe, um, be respectful. If you can feel it, you can understand it. If you can understand it, you can respect it. And if you can respect it, then you're surely going to want to protect it. So I think everybody here will agree with that. Um, a little, uh, little bits and pieces to just to reveal some answers, any of the polls, if anyone was doing any of that. Um, some of the questions, how many people live in the Galapagos in 2021? The answer was 32,000. Um, what percentage of the Galapagos is not national parkland? 3% was the answer. Um, how many people in Galapagos live in an urban area? That's 81% tells you about the makeup of the land. And how many schools does the Galapagos have? 25 is the answer there. Um, hopefully it will be more um, with your generous and kind support. So um, help us by sharing all the details of the Discovering Galapagos teaching guides and resources that you can find. Um, please hashtag it. Please support everybody. Um, support yourselves and your communities. Stay safe. Look after yourself. Um, look after nature. Uh, we only have one planet. Um, there is no second planet that we can go to. Don't listen to Elon and all those people who are telling us we can go to Mars. Let's protect this incredible planet that we live on. Um, it has everything to offer and more. We just have to be curious. We have to connect and 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 remain, um, you know, humble as part of the web of life. And so enjoy whatever you're doing for the rest of the day and year and onwards. So thank you for everybody. Um, greatly appreciated. Thank you, Jen and Ashley and Anne and everyone else. And there's a donate coming up now. So take that time and get involved and donate. 